in there, it'll take n on 2 on average. Yep. And if it is in there, it'll take n on 2 on average. So it's n on 2 both ways. But binary search works like this. You pick the number in the middle of the range. You, not the number in the middle. You pick the DVD in the middle. And you look to see if it is, its serial number is bigger or smaller than your serial number. And if it's bigger than the serial number you're looking for, you throw away all the DVDs on the big side and you look on the lower half. So you've thrown away half the DVDs in one swoop. And if it's smaller than the number you're looking for, then you throw away all the smaller DVDs and you can only look in the upper range and you've thrown away half. And then you repeat that process, picking the midway point, the midway point, the midway point, the midway point. So every time you do a comparison, you can throw away half the things you're looking for and at the end, how many do you find? How many, how many comparisons have you had to done to find the thing you want? Log n in the worst case, isn't it? Log n. Okay, because you halve every time. Log to the base 2 of n. So that's binary search. And I'm about to teach it. In fact, I will be teaching it next week. So, in fact, it probably comes up in your labs this week. So, someone gave me some code and gave me a question using the code. Now, the very first thing I did as soon as I saw it was have a heart attack and writhe around on the floor because that's what computer scientists do whenever they see an implementation of binary search. <laughs> because what do we know about any implementation of binary search that anyone has ever written ever? It's wrong. Binary search is such a simple idea, you'd think it would be hard to get wrong, but actually it's generally wrong when people implement it. And can I be precise? Someone, it might have been Sedgwick, I'll, I'll find it and put a link up, surveyed computer science textbooks that taught binary search. Most of them had an incorrect binary search in there. Binary searches in standard libraries issued with software languages or with operating systems have incorrect binary search coded in them. A brilliant computer programmer once demonstrated by proof in his uh, algorithms course that all the binary search algorithms in all the textbooks the students had was wrong and he gave them a correct implementation. And 10 years later, he realized to his embarrassment that his implementation was wrong. <laughs> it's a very simple idea of binary search, but it's very easy to get wrong. It's not that binary search, by the way, is different to any other problem in computing. It's very easy to get everything wrong. We get things wrong all the time. The problem with binary search is it's so deceptively simple that we, well, you tell me. Why do, why do we get it wrong? Have a guess. Oh, we can get everything, like the little details and the, like, the comparisons and all that we get. There are little fiddly details. There's lots of corners where errors are, could lurk. That's right. So there's lots of potential for getting things wrong. But why do you think we get binary search wrong? Do you notice whenever I come to this side, someone comes in that door. <laughs> and whenever I come to this side, no. um, were you waiting outside the whole time? No, no, because I just walked to that side and then you came in. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Maybe they'll come through both doors. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> I like the way you think it. Why do you think binary searches goes wrong? Yeah. Because it's easy. It's easy. So we. So you don't do any work on it. You think it's easy and you think, oh, I'll just. You think it's it easy. Really quick, and you think I'll write it really quick. And then, this is the important bit. You're dead right. And then. You just let it go. Because you. Because you know it's easy. And it's because right. you think. It's right. You think it's right. Oh, yeah. It's so easy. Yeah, let it be right. That you think it's right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, is this right? Oh, really? Tell me why it's not right. It breaches the style guide. <laughs> ah, it does breach the style guide. Very well done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How does it breach the style guide? That's multiple, returns. multiple returns from a function. Non-structured programming. Not allowed in this course. Number two. What's that? Number, reason number two. Uh, you don't have magic number. Is that oh, you shouldn't have a magic... Oh, yeah, dividing by two. Um, well, yes. Well... Yeah, well, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, so, shh, shh, shh. The problem with magic numbers, you know about the problem with magic numbers, don't you? The problem with magic numbers is multiple fold. One is they are unclear because they're a number, not a meaning. So when you read them, you read the number. So if it's the number of millimeters per inch, but you write whatever it is, 20 
4.5, 25.4, whatever it is. If you just write the number, it contains no information unless someone recognizes that constant. And if they recognize that constant, what are they? The fat man. <laughs> So in the exam, I'm going to ask a series of questions. What's this constant? What's that constant? And everyone that gets them right will lose marks. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so, um, so they contain no semantic information. So if you replace them with a name, the program reads, you put semantics in the program. The computer's just as happy, but people reading the program are happier. And the more information you get to the people reading, the more chance they have of spotting errors. And as you probably all know by now, programming is the art of spotting errors. You will write something, it will be wrong, it will have errors. How good your program is, is how easy it is to find those errors. Uh, another reason we, like we dislike magic numbers is they can change. And if you change it, you, want, you have the update problem there, that you might change it in some spots and not others, and that could be a catastrophe. Maybe it doesn't really matter what the constant is as long as it's the same everywhere. But you change it in one spot and not another, you're doomed. You know, maybe it's a flag value you're testing for. You insert a different flag, you're testing for a different flag, you never terminate or something. So it can change, you get the update problem. And the last reason is it can collide with other values. Like, and, and the classic example, that the first time I encountered magic numbers was in an insurance program where the interest rate was set to be 10%. It was written in a horrible language called APL and there were a whole lot of um, 1.1s everywhere where we're increasing by the interest rate. But unfortunately, we'd also assumed a growth rate in the population of 10%. So there were 1.1s everywhere for the growth rate in the population. And, and the, my boss gave it to me and said, ah, oh, we've realized this year that um, we're forecasting on 9%. I'd just like to see what the figures would look like at 9% interest. Can you change the program? And I said, sure. And I looked through and I realized I couldn't do a global search and replace of every 1.1 to 1.09 because then I would change um, the growth rates as well as the interest rates. So I actually have to go through completely understanding the whole program, which in APL is incredibly hard and time consuming. It's a terrible language. And uh, it took hours and hours. So yeah, so, um, so you attach semantics to things. But in this case, I would argue that um, dividing by two to find an average when we've given it the name middle, I would argue this is fairly clear. So probably this is one of the cases where you can break the style guide and get away with it. You can, are always allowed to break the style guide, by the way. You just have to convince your marker, your tutor, that your way of breaking it is clearer than following it. Uh, and your tutor will never be convinced if you have multiple returns from a function. <laughs> Don't think you can convince them of that. Because you... Switches, you can't convince them of switches. Switches unstructured too. No unstructured thing is allowed in this course. Because we're tyrannical, <laughs> which is a, a form of dinosaur. Okay. <laughs> so is this correct or not? We've got two possible errors, but I want, I want to know... Well, now we're in the position of Galileo. We're looking up and we're thinking, does the earth go around the sun or does the sun go around the earth? And we don't know the answer. So we're trying to work it out. We're going to, how can we work it out? We're going to make some measurements, do some theories, do some testing, do some stuff. And at the end, we're going to have a conclusion. But maybe our conclusion is going to be wrong. We like Galileo, but he wasn't right about everything. We like, uh, we like Lord Kelvin. He said something ridiculous. Thurston, what did Kelvin say that was ridiculous? What's that? Heavier than air flying machines will never take off. He thought, that's right. Lunatic, crazy man. Kelvin, famous for inventing the Kelvinator. People don't say ater on the ends of words often enough, I think. I think the Kelvinator, you know, he invented uh, you know, the temperature measurement scale. I think eta is to make it zero degrees Kelvin. Does anyone say eta on the end of a word? I read a book once where someone said an alligator was someone that made allegations. <laughs> that was very funny. Anyway, okay, so uh, returning to the point, working out whether this is correct or not is, I would say, the same sort of problem is, is a truth question. And we face the same problem scientists face in a garden day uh, scientists face, in normal scientists face in normal truth questions, which is it's very hard to know something's correct. We can prove it's incorrect, can't we? How would we prove it's incorrect? Finding one occasion it doesn't work. Yeah. So if we can falsify the theory we're in, but if we can't falsify the theory, the best we can say is we haven't falsified it so far. That's an interesting question. I wonder if that's correct or not. Has anyone in this room of really smart people spotted the flaw? You have? Don't tell me. Tell me later on. Oh, whisper it in my ear. Oh. 
assume that the data is false. Uh, uh, check it out. Uh, that wasn't an error that I had noticed. Check it out. It might, it might be an error. It might be an error. Um, okay. No, I don't want to hear because I want to leave this as an open question for everyone to think about. All right, let's go back. Oh, so can I say, I'll give you a hint. I thought it was wrong. And I said to the student, I think this is wrong. And the student said to me, what? The student said to me, it's not wrong. And I said, it is wrong. And he said, I don't think it is wrong. And I said, go and have a look. You'll find it's wrong. And he went and looked and looked and looked and looked and looked and didn't see anything wrong with it. And then I ran it. And I wasn't quite sure whether it was right or wrong, but I was pretty sure it was wrong because I had proved it wrong using a mathematical technique rather than actually executing it. So I unrolled the mathematical technique I used to prove it wrong and I found a pathological case that I thought would cause it to fail. I plugged that case in and the program failed and we had a core dump and then I sent him a picture of the program running and the core dump, <laughs> commenting out the actual test case that I put in so he couldn't see what I'd actually done. And uh, I think he found the error then within about two minutes. I'm making that number up. But why do you think he looked and looked and looked before he gave it to me, presumably, not wanting to give me incorrect code? Of course he'll find the error. What's that? He sent him a code. No, I didn't send him a code dump. I sent him a picture. So, um, I could easily have said that, but I was tricking you. <laughs> uh, now, I, what I sent him was enough, not enough information to show the problem had happened, but not that there was a problem, not what it was. Um, so, but the question I'm asking, and this is how we got into this whole long diversion to start with, was... Why do you think he couldn't find the error initially? Why do you think he couldn't find the error when I told him there was an error? And why do you think when I proved that there was an error, he could find the error so quickly? He, he didn't believe it. Thank you very much. He believed it was correct. So the first time he was looking for an error, but he didn't think there was one there. And the second time I told him there was an error, he was a bit suspicious, but he knows I make mistakes all the time. So he, in his heart, still didn't believe it. But once I showed him the thing, he believed it. And once he believed it, he found it. What is this telling us about our testing, about our ability to find truth? It is very easy when you're doing science. You say it. You're going to say it better than me. What's that? We're biased. Science faces this problem all the time. When we do an experiment in science, we have a theory. We think the theory is right. The, the danger facing all scientists is they may well do tests to support their theory. They may well do weak testing. Like I heard on the Gruen transfer, I don't know if anyone's seen that, that uh, companies that uh, advertise cigarettes as punishment in the UK are forced to advertise anti-smoking campaigns, fund anti-smoking campaigns. And they showed an example of an anti-smoking campaign that these companies fund, and it was a really crap anti-smoking campaign. I think it was something like, kids that smoke are dope, man, don't do it. <laughs> And statistics showed that even just showing people smoking in an anti-smigarette campaign triggers um, people's desire to smoke. So it actually, their anti-smoking campaign was a smoking campaign. But the whole point was, they didn't want to stop people smoking, so their anti-smoking campaign wasn't honestly constructed. That's advertising. We don't expect honesty there. That's cigarette companies. We don't expect honesty there. Really, we don't. But on scientists, we have a high standard from honesty. We expect that scientists will try and prove their resu right, results right. Uh, we, expect, we don't expect that scientists will try and prove their result right. We expect that scientists will try to prove their results wrong. And this is where we're all leading up to here um, in notions of truth. Uh, how do we falsify things in skepticism? Uh, so now let me just show you the Milgram experiment. You might have all heard of the Milgram experiment. It's an obedience experiment. People were invited to come along and participate in a learning experiment where they were going to be the teacher and a subject who was the learner was strapped into a chair with electrodes attached to him, attached to a very scary looking machine. And the teacher was told that if the learner got something wrong, they were to give them a small electric shock. And there was a dial on this machine that went from 15 volts all the way up to 400 volts. And the last few had big red crosses above them. <laughs> and before the experiment started, the person went up to the machine themselves and they had a sample shock of 50 volts or something. Oh, <laughs> Then they went into the room and did the experiment. 
It's called the obedience test because the guy Milgram conducting the test didn't give a damn about teaching and learning. In fact, everyone else involved in the whole thing was an actor, including the guy strapped to a chair. Um, they were trying to see how, people, how obedient people were. When they were told something, when they were told to do something, whether they would do it. So here we have an actual uh, extract from one of the participants who was in the experiment. They recently did a doco on it. Can everyone hear this? Let me just make it loud. Oh, you can't see it? Thank you. And you won't be able to hear it if you can't see it. But let's see if we can hear things. How can I test? Make a dong sound? How do I? Well, but then I'll lose my spot. Shh, I'll just go. Let's go. Shh, shh, listen. Is everyone ready? Man, coat, paint. Your answer is wrong. You received 60 volts. It's... Thin paint. Clean. Face, fight, hand, yard. Your answer is wrong. You received 75 volts. I think the first sound that I heard, and I can't tell you how far into it it was, but it was like, mm, like that, like he felt something. It wasn't a scream, I don't think. It seems to me that it was, um, you know, a, an indication of discomfort. Wrong. White horse. 150 volts. The learner may have gotten the first one or two correct, but it became quite obvious that uh, he was a, a very dim-witted learner, and uh, so each failure I imposed a shock, and the level started to rise uh, very rapidly. And I could hear him, uh, his cries of pain and and request, stop this, uh, cut it out, this hurts, and uh, similar expressions. And at the same time, the experimenter standing above me was instructing me very seriously that uh, I had to go on. I, I became increasingly uncomfortable as we went up to about 100 volts, and I became increasingly agitated and concerned uh, and of course the uh, the experimenter dealt with all objections with one or more of several phrases like uh, you must continue or the experiment requires that you continue or you have no choice true story hero speech report This is wrong. 270. The, the correct answer is true story. The next one is blue boy girl grass hat. This is correct. The next one is knife, day, sky, job, chair. This is wrong. Did you know? Yes, right from where you left off uh, on the board. 285 volts. The next one is fat, man, Lady, tub, neck. This is wrong. 300 volts. I can't do this. I can't do this. I'm sorry. I realize that you're trying to do something. 
the experiment requires you to think deeper. Yes, I know. But, uh, I'm just not the type of person that uh, can inflict pain. I felt it's gone far beyond what I should have. It's absolutely essential as you continue. Please go on. Yeah, I'm getting to the point now I can just feel each one with them. The next one is green, grass, hat, ink, apple. This is incorrect. 315 volts. So did you hear that? The guy doing the, uh, the guinea pig of the experiment, but he thought he was running the experiment, uh, at one point when he heard the screaming off, maybe you couldn't hear, it was a bit muffled, he said, I can't go on with this. I've gone way beyond what I should have done. I can't cause pain to another person. I know what you're doing is an important experiment, but I don't think I can do it. I don't think I can cause pain to another person. And the experimenter simply said, you must go on. The experiment requires you to continue. There's a pause. The guy sighs, and then he asks the next question, and then applies 315 volts to the guy. And it keeps going up and up. And it is the most tragic thing to listen to this. A whole lot of people doing the experiment eventually break down and say they can't do it. The experimenter says, you must do it. So they keep going. Now, this is, remember I was talking about notions of scientific truth. This is how we're going to finish off scientific truth. By saying, in science, the most important quality to have is skepticism. An honest skepticism. So you are skeptical of your own results. You are skeptical of what other people tell you. You are skeptical of what I tell you. You are skeptical of what an experimenter tells you must be done. You don't care what other people say or think. Just because you think something is right and there isn't an error in your program, you don't test it more laxly. A good scientist is skeptical to the core, doesn't believe anything, is a horny bastard, a hornery bastard, and <laughs> <laughs> probably as well. And placed in that, exper in that experiment there, and later on we hear people talking. Shh, shh. Later on in this interview, if anyone wants to hear, I'll give you a link. They, they start talking about when people came in, they quickly got an idea if they were going to be an obedient person or not. If they were going to do what they were told and think what they were, you know. No, no, no one's electrocuted. It's just an, it's, they're acting. It's the person applying the shocks that is being um, tested. They want to see if someone will do horrible things they don't want to do simply because someone tells them they do. I mean, this, is, this was around the time of, uh, there was a lot of reflection on what had happened in Germany and the Nazis and man's inhumanity to man and just wondering what can people be made to do to other people just because they're told to do it to other people. Yes? Um, with the experiment, was there anything online when they were told the experiment must go on before? Were they told like they'd get some kind of money? For oh, no. They were very, oh, yeah, they were all given $5 to come along, but they could keep that yeah. even if they left. Uh, listen to the whole thing. They, they rehearsed it for like nine months before they actually started doing it. The experimenter was only allowed to say, you must continue. The experiment requires you to continue. And just by saying this, people continued. And I think we would all like to think in our hearts that in this situation we would be strong enough to break free. But you cannot do it. It is very difficult. I would like to think I could do it, but I'm glad I was never tested. Someone was telling me about the experiments of, oh, what was it, the guy that measured the electric charge initially? Was that Milkian or someone? And he did some oil drop experiment and worked out the charge on an electron. <laughs> someone was telling me, I wish I could remember the details, but it essentially it went like this. He worked out some constant for the charge or mass of an electron or something like that. He published his results, he was famous, everyone agreed with it, and then other people tried to reproduce his results. But because he made some assumption about air viscosity or something that was wrong, his results were wrong. He had computed the wrong charge on an electron. Anyone else conducting the experiments would have got answers at odds with his. But he was the eminent famous person. So everyone reported results very similar to his. And if you look at the um, published studies recording the charge on an electron or whatever the experiment was, over time, and you plot their charge, you see slowly the answer drifts from his up to the correct value. 
because the scientists weren't being honest. They would have thought, shit, hang on, I'm out by 10%. Oh, no. Oh, I can throw away that case because the drop fell too quickly. And I can throw away this one. And this is probably erroneous. And justifying to themselves, they twiddled and fiddled, we're guessing, and massaged the data until it looked sort of reasonable. And then once someone had got one a bit higher, it was okay for the next person to get a bit higher. But no one was being honest. Like Mendel. You know Mendel that studied genetics? And he looked for um, dominant and recessive traits. And he looked at peas. Do you remember all that stuff you learned in primary school? Someone did a mathematical analysis of Mendel's results and discovered they were too good to be true. The chance of him actually getting results so statistically perfect and supporting his theory are vanishingly small, less than one in two to the whatever number you want to invent. In other words, he faked his results. It was okay because he had the right idea. What he was proving was correct. So it was okay he faked his results because he was faking, the, you know, he... He didn't understand experimental error. He, did, he was right. He just removed the experimental error. But he had no way of knowing he was right. So it's not okay. He should have reported the actual results. When Glenn was talking in that video that I have posted, do you remember at the very end he said this really compelling thing? He said, it's important to work out what tests you're going to apply, what plan you're going to follow, your line of analysis and research before you do the experiment. It's no good just fiddling and diddling like we computer scientists are like inclined to do, fooling around and trying this and trying that and making it up as we go along, because that's not really honest. An honest person, an honest, a scientific honesty is you set yourself your standards for success and failure in advance of doing the experiments, you force yourself to follow a particular plan, and you carry it through to the end, and then you see if you succeeded or failed, and you don't twiddle and fiddle your results to make yourself fail, make yourself succeed. Um, yeah. So skepticism. Don't be the obedient person. I talked about Glenn. Oh, yeah, the last thing to talk about, and that'll be the end, and then we'll take a break, is um, the notion of the cargo cult. Richard Feynman talks about this. You know the cargo cults, the famous um, thing that happened during the war? Well, it was started before the war, but during the Second World War in a lot of Pacific islands, some of which hadn't been visited by Western civil or any people from anywhere before. A lot of these remote Pacific islands, the Japanese and then the uh, Allies, uh, in turn, used them as bases. And they used to set up airfields on them and then drop supplies and parachute supplies. And there were all these people living there that had very sparse primitive lives, I assume. And suddenly the army turned up with all the machines and supplies and food and bananas and amazing things, and they would share some of it with the people there. And the people there couldn't believe their luck. These must be like gods appeared out of the skies and just started giving them stuff. And then sometimes they'd hear an aeroplane go overhead and people, the Americans or whoever it was, would run out on the runway and light the flares, and there'd be a pause, and then <whistles> all these parachuted supplies would drift down, and the Americans would get them and open them up. And then they just look like, from the gods, it's incredible. It's this cargo. This cargo is coming from the gods. So long after the Allies left and the Japanese left and everything had returned to normal, they used to want the cargo to come again. So they would put the flares out on the runway. They would make fake headsets out of coconut shells. And fake, they, made, they made rough stone radios. And they would mimic all the things that they'd seen the Americans doing that made this stuff appear from the sky. Now, Feynman talks about this. Richard Feynman, a brilliant scientist. Oh, yeah, the gods must be crazy. I've seen that. That's an awesome film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cargo cult science. You should read it. Richard Feynman talking about this notion of honesty and dishonesty in science and talking about this notion of um, cargo cult science. And I just got his quote. I wanted to grab here. He recommended that researchers... Oh, you can't see it? You can't see it. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm clicking on links you can't. And there's a picture of Richard Feynman nude. <laughs> oh, my God. There's the exam. He recommend, oh, I can't believe I'm showing you that. He recommended that researchers adopt an unusually high level of honesty, which is rarely encountered in everyday life. And he gives examples from advertising politics, behavioral psychology, to illustrate everyday dishonesty, which is unacceptable in science. Um, it's... It's reproduced in his book, Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman, which everyone should read. It is simultaneously the funniest, the most intellectually challenging, and the most interesting book about science and thinking and philosophy you could ever read. So I'll put a link for that up. We'll take a break now, and we'll return in 10 minutes uh, to continue with the lecture.